All right, everyone. Hello and welcome from everyone around the world to another session of iDesign's webcast series. This particular session is titled Know Thy Team. My name is Michael Montgomery. I see a lot of uh, familiar names that have uh, gone online today. But for those of you who don't know me, I'm a software architect with iDesign and also a former chief software architect. I've had the luck of putting many iDesign method solutions into production. So that's given me a very unique perspective on how well the iDesign method speaks to the full software development life cycle, as well as particular insight in what it takes to bring large multi-team initiatives to success. I'm also a specialist in SOA and connected technologies particularly WCF. And of course, I do the speaker thing at regional and national events. And I also particularly enjoy writing articles about architecture for the industry at large and to help the modern software architect. And lastly, when I can, I try to participate in my local technology users group. And I think that's actually something vitally important for the modern architect to actually participate in their local community. What I hope to share with you today is my observations from and experiences from running large multi-team initiatives and some of the tips, tricks, and techniques that I've used to try to gain a better understanding of getting these teams to actually operate and produce. Uh, even though we end up with a very broad and unique set of individuals to try to achieve these goals. So we'll take a look at some of my techniques for gaining insight into the team, sustaining success, which is all important, of course, at the end of the day. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with some comments on firing on what I call firing on all cylinders, which is the three big main aspects of what I've seen large initiatives or even an individual team needs to truly have sustainable success. Consistency, repeatability, and sustainability over the long haul. Give you guys a second to absorb this. This comment was actually made by one of my good friends who is also an expert uh, architect. Best way to motivate geeks is not to demotivate them. Simply put, why? Any of you who have been in this industry long enough to know that the geeks come highly self-motivated. So the best thing that we can do is create an environment for them to thrive in and be creative. Anything that we do counter to that, and then we start to actually demotivate them. And they reduce their energy. They reduce their motivation. They reduce their output, and it goes from there. So that's really the gist of what it takes to get these geeks. And of course, I use that term in the most affectionate and positive way, being a geek myself. I want to start off with taking a look at the current state of the industry, some of the ideals the industry has, and then we'll take a somewhat comedic look at your personal reality. So let's take a look at what you long for. Now, I know this ought to be true because I've been through this many times, and I've actually heard it from other organizations. What you long for is a team like this. And unfortunately, everyone's muted, so hopefully I'm hearing the laughter in the room. For those uh, international uh, attendees who may not have come across this pinnacle of American pop culture from TV series back in the 70s, this is the A team. So why do I say this is what you long for? Because these guys were a crack group of specialists. They could get the job done. You could throw them anything. 
and they would figure it out a way to actually achieve it. They would self-govern, they would self-mediate, they would self-motivate, and not only were they specialists, but each has could cover each other's back when necessary. So in your ideal reality, you'd love to just have every single team be able to rock with anything that you gave to them, experts in multiple specialties. Industry actually has a term for this. Uh, many of you that I've talked to personally and had discussions about this have come across the term called generalizing specialist. So the industry actually has this desire to have these teams of generalizing specialists that you can throw any problem at and they will self-govern, self-mediate, and self-motivate. Some management methodologies actually assume that you have a team of these kind of people. In the industry at large, they define this term excuse me, as a renaissance developer. One or more specialties. They have deep technical expertise. They're involved in their community and they're often thought, uh, producing thought leadership. In addition to all of that, they have strong knowledge in both the uh, SDLC, the Software Development Lifecycle, and the business domain that they're involved in. They have an aggressive passion for deepening their existing specialties, both technical and domain. Sounds just like all the guys that you have in your developer community, right? So let's take a look at what you actually have. I'll give you a moment to take a look at this. Again, this is a, a, a little gem from American TV pop culture. Now, don't laugh because these guys saved Christmas. In no way am I being disparaging to anyone's developer community. I would consider myself part of this ragtag crew. But the reality here is that this is really what we have to deal with in today's industry circa 2013. We have a disparate group of individuals that we have to bring together to actually achieve a common goal and produce success. Not easy. What that represents to me is that you have a developer community of a broad spectrum of acumen. Generalizing specialists are incredibly rare, and if you do happen to have someone who is really a true specialist in multiple disciplines, they are split, spread way too thin. This day and age, there's simply too many expert technologies, and the industry pace is too fast to, to be an expert in but a few. And of course, we all know that if someone during an interview tells you they are an expert in everything, at this day and age, that's just simply laughable. The last one is really key, actually. Uh, I haven't met anyone yet that disagrees with this around the world. Engineering discipline uh, enrollment in universities uh, previously had been dropping, so that included software-related disciplines. So right now, even though it's starting to pick up again, that puts us in a situation where there is a palpable talent drought around the world. Not just in any given country or particularly the United States, but around the world. So given this reality that you have to deal with, you have a developer community of a broad spectrum of acumen, you have few generalizing specialists, what do you need to try to facilitate sustainable growth and sustainable success? Well, many of us believe you need one of these guys. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is the all-seeing architect from the movie series The Matrix. The point being here is that this character represents the personality of the broad view, the technical expert, 
the member of your organization that really sees the whole thing and how all the pieces work together. But of course, in the movie, if you're familiar with it, there was a dark side. Too much of this, and it drives everything in a certain direction. I believe that in addition to that, you also need this. Now, this is another character, a persona from the particular movie. This is the Oracle, and her personality represented that more human aspect that also has to be in play, the yin and yang between that purely technical aspect and the more soft skills human aspect. And this, we can't stress enough at iDesign, our architecture clinic is actually focused on this. The soft skills of both the architect and the manager are equally important to the design savvy and technical acumen that you have to possess. So what we believe at iDesign is the architect plays a pivotal role as the missing glue in today's modern uh, development community. It is the position that acts as liaison, translator, Rosetta Stone between the business and development. What I like to call the liaison between the suits and the geeks. The architect has a particular passion that enables them to get past the difficult point and master certain technologies relevant to their daily uh, needs and often become generalizing masters of more than one. They are also acting, as many of you know from the way I design pictures the modern software architect, leadership in process design and technology. I like to consider this position both shepherd and shaman. And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by those terms. But generally, they are the shepherd. They are the one who brings the system to completion. It is their responsibility to do that. And the shaman the one who actually has the initial vision on how the bigger, broader view actually will come to fruition. Sometimes you need to be the benevolent dictator and soft skills, as I said, which we'll talk about further throughout this session, are really essential. So if we say you have to know your developer community, do you know them? You have this broad spectrum of both personalities and acumen. Few, if any, generalizing specialists. You may have some personalities that are archetypal, or many of us, almost to a one, have very interesting idiosyncrasies. It's just the nature of our industry. Some of these idiosyncrasies actually make us good at what we do. And you may or may not actually have an architect. So why is it so important to actually know your developer community? Because operating under unrealistic expectations will kill your project. And I can't say that or stress that enough, and I've seen it firsthand, that if you do not know your team and the reality of what you have, the raw materials, let's say, of what you have to deal with, to bring an initiative to success if you try to cookie cutter and try to use a one-size-fits-all approach to every single team. Unfortunately, from a perspective of eye design, we often come in to heal these six situations. So that's where the whole title of this session comes from. How do we know them? For the architect, one word really sums it up, in my opinion. You have to engage. You cannot be an ivory tower architect. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know that term, it's become a very negative stigma uh, for the architecture 
discipline in the industry at large. Ivory Tower architects are the guys who sit in the vaulted ivory tower, produce massive amounts of uh, designs that are expansive. Taj Mahal, when only something very small and rudimentary is needed, they often just pass these designs down to development with little explanation and or guidance. And then they expect the developers to just be able to operate on them. My experience, what really facilitates sustainable success and growth is that as an architect, you must engage, be hands-on, roll up your sleeves and get dirty. It is 110% mentorship. For the architect, this means a lot of work. Reviews, hands-on labs, tech challenges, questions and quizzes, even hackathons, brown bags. Hosting all these different avenues to get out in your developer community, in your organization, facilitate knowledge exchange, and develop their acumen. One of the best ways I've found to get to know your developer community better is every good architecture is supported by a top-notch infrastructure. What that means is that there's a little bit of technology mitigation to simplify the programming model. And usually, the architects are the ones who actually own building that little bit of infrastructure. You may not have a standing infrastructure team. Instead, you may invite developers from different teams on occasion for brief periods of time to build something. Adding a new feature to the infrastructure in of itself doesn't take a long time. And you know, for if, depending on what methodology you're running as a sprint, per, for example, it may only take a couple of weeks. You invite them into the infrastructure team for a couple of weeks. You get to know these guys much better. You're actually running and overseeing this in a day-to-day -day interaction kind of uh, operating model. They get to learn more about what the infrastructure actually does. They get a leg up on some expert technology, such as WCF. And so it's good for everyone involved. Management on the other side, I truly believe that the title is somewhat of a misnomer. Management, from my experience, gets so involved in managing the project, they often forget the soft skill side of really being engaged as well with their architect, with the developers that they are overseeing. They need to know the capabilities of each team and each member, their capacity, their stamina. The best way that I've seen that's worked well with me, and there's some people on the line today for which hopefully they had the similar experience, the product manager, project manager, or and architect, or a team, along with managing the project, they are also facilitating growth within their developer community. And as always, the soft skills directly apply. Throughout this, which some of you who are familiar with iDesign's uh, approach to project design, a lot of this is watching. Watching and taking note of what's, what you're seeing. Both roles should observe changes in quality trends. If the quality starts to suffer, that can definitely be a, a significant indicator that something's not quite right. Analysis paralysis. If you're having a hard time getting teams to actually break through a logjam to move forward on a difficult problem, or they're afraid to give you estimations, or there's a general sense that they don't want to do something that may take a little courage because they have the fear of being wrong, which can really stagnate a team if there's a dynamic where uh, good ideas are being left on the shelf because someone doesn't have the courage to create. Um, you watch the team interplay day to day. And of course, you've got to be 
watch out for burnout. Burnout is like the 800-pound gorilla in our industry, and it's very real, very, very real. And for anyone who has actually experienced it, it can take quite a long time to come back. I actually, when I do the architecture clinics, I actually ask each class their experience about burnout, and particularly a question, has their, has their industry, has their discipline, their job made them sick? And almost two of one, every single person at one time or another raises their hand and has a story about that reality. So that's something we really have to be aware of because obviously if, if the death marches are, are hurting people, um, that's really no way anyone wants to live or move on uh, day to day in their, in their job, in their career. With that, we want sustained success. So I chose this picture in the, in the general idea of nurturing all of this, growing it, so to speak, because I truly believe that the, the, uh, both management and the architect have to be hands-on, and they have to be willing to get their hands dirty. So there's this notion of shepherding success. So now that you have a little more understanding, you've engaged with your team, knowing is not enough. It has to be day-to-day -day participation. You can't know and then do some course correction in your planning and expect that it's just going to mag magically take care of itself throughout the whole long uh, crusade of a big initiative. It's got to be day-to-day. And for those of you who have difficulty putting that in, you've got to schedule it. In the end, the architect, the project manager are responsible. If they do not deliver, it is not their fault. So from the manager perspective on sustainable success, there's the notion of becoming a two-minute manager. This means that you should have everything together to a degree that you manage the project for two minutes and the rest of your day is spent the human factor. Of course, there's the inevitable attending of meetings, but you're tracking, you're recalculating, you're recalibrating, and you're keeping an, idea, an eye on each team and attuning your approach to each one. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. One thing for those of you who are familiar with the uh, iDesign approach to project design, the notion of the critical path. People that are on and working on the critical path because it, after all, means the, the initial success of the endeavor that should be evangelized. There should be no, some, something within the community, within the culture, that recognizes the, fa the fact that they are actually participating on the critical path and how important that is. Again, it's vitally important to tune your approach per team. Cookie-cutter approaches just don't work. And always keeping an, a, uh, an eye on the burnout. I think one of the things that's really a challenge for management and for the architect is that you have to be willing to try different things. Be willing to change your approach if it's not working. Or if you see changes in some of the metrics you're obtaining, you know, really doing root cause while the initiative is unfolding, to try to course correct. Um, one thing that I think works really well is not only using your stand-up for, for status updates, but taking an opportunity to actually watch the personalities in the room and seeing how they interact, particularly with young teams or early in the initiative. And be willing to wean off stand-up, stand-ups, over time as teams begin to develop maturity. So one observation I'll share with you that speaks directly to the idea of burnout, being able to get the team to operate cohesively, is the notion that software is really a team sport. And what I mean by that 
is something like this, the metaphor of professional cycling. I don't personally cycle, yet, not yet at least. Um, when my running career is over, i probably switch to that. It's a great form of exercise. It's not difficult on your body. But the reason that I like to associate it with software development is the fact that there's many similarities. It's a long endeavor. There are races within the race. There are sprints. There are mountains to climb. Each team has a group of specialists, and they're even multidisciplined. But the key thing is that no one person can pull the en entire distance. Everyone takes a turn at the front. And everyone should get an opportunity to rest. There's something to consider. For the architect, sustaining success, for me, that's really setting up the whole thing by training. You really get engaged. You train your developer community. I suggest formalizing a curriculum. It goes from whether it's technology that you're going to roll out or methodology, such as the iDesign method. You need to at least give them an opportunity to ask questions directly, mentor them directly. It gives you a, a great opportunity to get induced or introduced to your developer community, and you just start doing things you do an intro, you do a deep dive, maybe a couple advanced classes in small little vignettes of two hours because you know you, you don't want to take up too much of their time. And slowly through that direct content, you develop a rapport with your whole developer community. You also must guide them. That guidance that we're talking about, and we truly believe the soft skills and a day-to-day -day engagement is deeply embedded and then govern. And the reality is that some things with these teams are non-negotiable. Everything, while we can certainly discuss it, is not up for a vote. And the architect's position, the role, is really the reality of which most archi aspiring architects don't truly appreciate, that it is a relatively small amount of design and the rest of it is doing what's necessary, that what I like to call 110% mentorship to sustain success. One thing that works really well uh, that has become almost, for iDesign, something that we promote, and I have built architect practices in the past and try to help our clients formalize their own architect practice, you need to avoid these high-risk team models, where there's one generalizing specialist or one guy who's really doing almost 90% of the work, and everyone else is kind of following along on their coattails. Instead, what has worked really well for me is developing a guild within the organization well, you have some apprenticeship, you have a transfer of knowledge, it pays long-term dividends. It's another thing that the architect is responsible for. Uh, it really promotes the survival of architecture as people come and go, and it provides these uh, technology people with a clear career path. At iDesign, we have we talk a great deal about this notion of handoff points. Again, no ivy, ivy tower architecture. You just don't throw the design over the wall and crush the guys on the other side. You encourage them to get involved. And the handoff point is crucial in that. Essentially, that's it, it's not a single point either. There's a great way to kick it off, though, where you engage the team you have open discussion about the design. You convey all the decisions that have been made that are actually captured in that design. The apprentice or the senior architect engages the team um, and really gives the team a sense that 
This is a, not just something that you're going to pass off, but you're going to going to be there with them day to day throughout the long term. We talk about the handoff points being either senior or junior, and this really promotes efficiency, meaning that if you have a senior team, they can do much of the work themselves. They do not need you to handhold them through every small little thing. This puts the notion uh, into play then of gathering just enough information for a given team to move forward effectively. You can imagine with one level of just enough, with a junior team, it's something completely different. So for a senior team, of course, this is the mature team. Sometimes you may only give them the raw materials and when they are fully comfortable with their own methodology, such as the iDesign method, they and their apprentice may actually be able to produce a design, which the senior architect then reviews, and they're off rocking. Um, they actually only require occasional oversight. This is the ideal team. Don't demotivate them. Do they really need a daily stand-up? You can I've had a lot of success in seeing organizations wean off the daily stand-up as the team grows in maturity. The junior handoff, on the other hand, is something completely different. This is really a lot of work for the architect. You, and you must plan for what type of handoff you have for a given team. It's essential. If you plan with unrealistic expectations, as we mentioned earlier, the plan will just become a daily pain because it's you're not going to you've either you have unrealistic over expectation or unrealistic under expectation, and if you mismatch with the team personalities and the team capability and their stamina even, then you're really not being efficient, and then demotivation creeps in. Junior handoffs in relation to the iDesign method, of course, mean that the architect is doing almost everything up to the point where they can fill in the stubs on the scaffolding of their design. You have a lot of one-on-ones. You have to produce a vertical slice to give them a working model so they can actually absorb it and play with it in their own time to truly understand how the software is to be built. And it requires constant vigilance. I mean, honestly, this could be that they absolutely need a daily stand-up or maybe two. This also means you need to support your developer community with standards. Standards are no joke. They are very important. You have to have a certain rigor when, you, when it comes to developing software. The key there to truly convey to them that this is real and not just something that's a piece of paper to be ignored is that your standards must be enforced. Most developers are looking for constraint because they want certain portions of those decisions to be made and be consistent across everyone who is developing. And then they want to be able to see that these decisions, when they actually uh, abide by the rules and follow the guidance and policy that it's actually being enforced. It actually becomes somewhat game theory. Sometimes you can turn it into a game to see who can comply and produce the cleanest code. And both of the standards training and enforcement go for both coding and for design. Again, infrastructure is a great way that the architect practice can, can support the developer community. And for me, infrastructure is absolutely essential. You have to mitigate the risks of expert technologies. If you do not, those, the developers will be left to their own devices to choose an approach that may or may not be compatible with the actual design that you are planning to implement. Mitigating 
these expert technologies by wrapping them in a, in a light layer of infrastructure also gives you the opportunity to wrap best practice, lower the bar of entry from a programming model, enforce policy within and enforce patterns, and then provides a control way that they can extend the system. And a perfect example is WCF that allows all these things. You can actually simplify it with a little bit of light infrastructure to mitigate the risk of WCF, which of course is configuration. Wrap up the knobs so it's all consistent. And that way the, the goal of infrastructure is to really, again, reduce the plumbing concern or the day-to-day -day busy work concern so that the devs can focus on providing business value. Of course, the best way that an architect can support his developer community is using a structured methodology. Uh, I think everyone on the line appreciates the value of the, uh, something such as the iDesign method. We can't say enough about the fact of what kind of clarity and discipline it brings to a software organization, that you actually produce blueprints for construction. This is the way that these call chains are actually meant to be built. At a certain point, the diagrams are code. It mitigates analysis paralysis. It mitigates a wild, wild west patch quilt of different approaches. And it solves many more problems than it poses and answers many more questions than it produces. The other thing the architect can do is promote what I call my three A's. New in an initiative, you first have to have something that they can absorb. If they can't even absorb your diagrams or the concepts that you're putting forth, then there's no way they can ever expect to be to act on them. Once they absorb what you're, you're sharing with them, again, hands-on and engaged, then they can adopt it themselves. Once they adopt it, then they can become advocates on their own right. Those three, I've seen that progression through time as organizations develop maturity uh, is essential to producing grassroots support for the architect practice. So finally, we'll, we'll talk about a little, a little bit about firing on all cylinders. What I mean is when you've got a large initiative and you've really had success in small places and you, you want that success to pay off. What is the payoff for all this investment? Because it does take time to do these things. None of this is free. Growth. And the metaphor here, of course, is that with that investment, not only will you have growth, but you'll have, they will produce fruitful uh, products, which mean that they will produce, be able to produce sustainable results, which I think is the key over the long haul. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the consistency, repeatability, and sustainability, which I think are the big three. All these things come together, multi-team initiatives to reduce integration friction, which can be incredibly expensive. Uh, anyone who knows the current thoughts in the test community, even with 100% unit test coverage, at best you can find 30% of your defects. The remaining 70%, if not much more, are integration of a large distributed system. Then you gain the dividends also of the shared knowledge one of which opens up new management method, methodologies, such as service-oriented development, where you can take a team, now that you're, you have some consistency across the way that they build, and take a team member, transplant them from one team to another, and actually allow them to hit the ground running much quick, more quickly because they, can, they already have a feel for what they expect to see. And then we, of course, always want to empower the ability to improve quality. Consistency, again, some things are non-negotiable. There has to be some decisions made collectively, either by the architects and then by the developer community on how we're going to operate. 
silos in this day and age simply do not work. I think we've all recognized that bringing a bunch of silos together is incredibly expensive and time consuming. It's where we share methodologies across the initiative, standards enforcement, design oversight. They all build against the same infrastructure. And then there's continual both management and architect insights. The repeatability really comes from the fact that these teams are producing high quality code. They understand the operating model and the values of opting into uh, a higher degree of discipline and rigor. And they can produce very similar results. The last bullet is what we actually do in, the, in iDesign's architecture clinic, we first produce what is effectively we call the design anti, anti design effort, which means that you give one team, you give two teams the same set of use cases, tell one team to, to design the best system they can design, tell the other team to design the worst system they can design, and without some kind of structured way to analyze and decompose the problem, they often produce the same exact design. I've also, at the end of the week in the clinic, we effectively do what we could call the design confirmation effort. We give a group, a team, or a set of teams, the same use cases, and largely they produce very similar designs. I've done this in organizations, and it's very satisfying when you attain that level of maturity because you can feel confident that the teams can repeat the design and construction efforts largely in a similar fashion. And that's, that gives you a high level of confidence then by knowing the nature of your developer community that you can truly either let them go, motivate them more, and you can start to run even more in parallel. Sustainability is key for the long haul. Some philosophies on the approach of our uh, building software are keyed on the fact that tomorrow may never come. But most of us who have lived, uh, have been practicing in this, in this industry for a long period of time know that tomorrow always comes. So if you don't sustain success past V1, what happens when you get past V1 and everyone clinks the champagne glasses and all the goodness has happened? There's even more work past V1 than there is in building V1. You need to ensure that architectural survival, the knowledge exchange, day-to-day -day rigor, continue to mitigate the risk of expert technologies, and it's all then creates a developer community that's firing on all cylinders, but also improves your tension, your morale, even the team scalability. In the end, the holy grail is the self-sustaining teams. They can largely run themselves with a little bit of guidance. There is a rigor to the day-to-day -day and the operating model where they understand the expectations and the inputs how to execute, and what's expected of them for their deliverables. The moral of all this, if there's anything else that you take away from this, is that could he, from my experience, cookie cutter approaches to team management do not work. You have to have realistic expectations of what your teams can actually produce and figure out ways within your culture to understand the nature of your teams. Know thy team. And the final comment is for the architects in particular is that when you need them but do not want them, they must stay. When you want them but no longer need them, then they must go. And that's the whole concept of stepping back. You have to be able to step back when these teams reach maturity. And, and it's really a, a wonderful moment when they acknowledge the fact that they can largely sustain their own capabilities. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. All right, everyone. Travel safe and uh,
thank you again for your attention, and we'll probably see you again soon. Take care.